North America is the world's hotspot of salamander diversity, with around half the world's species. The U.S. in particular has more kinds than any other country, but more than 40% of this salamander diversity is threatened. Habitat loss is the main driver behind declines of U.S. amphibians. However, a pandemic is on the horizon, a fungal pathogen called the Trachochytrium salamandivorans, or b -cell, which almost completely wiped out several fire salamander populations in Europe. Studies may indicate that if not most U.S. salamanders are susceptible to b -cell, including many threatened species. Biologists worry the disease will be the final nail in the coffin for salamander populations already weakened by other pressures, and are trying to figure out how they stand to be affected and how best to rescue them. My name is Mike DiGirolamo, your host for Manga Bay Explorers, a special podcast series about some of the most recent reporting from MangaBay.com's global team. Join me for a deeper discussion of one such project, where I'll explore the issues with experts on the front lines of the looming salamander pandemic to find out what we know now and what is being done to keep North America's and the world's salamanders safe. My guest today is Manga Bay senior editor Morgan Erickson Davis, who in 2018 and 2019 reported on a series of this potential B-cell pandemic. We dive into the truly unique biodiversity of the United States and what makes it home to such a plethora of salamander species not seen anywhere else in the world, why it matters to our forest ecosystems, and most importantly, what we stand to lose. Can you tell me what is it about the United States that makes it so uniquely hospitable for so many salamanders? Yeah, that's a great question because it's very strange. So normally the tropics are the most species places, the most biodiverse. And so the fact that the U.S. has about like half of the world's salamander species is pretty remarkable and really strange. That shouldn't happen. Like it should be in the tropics somewhere. The, the secret lies in the Appalachians. So the Appalachians are super old and there's like a bunch of little rivers in them and there's just enough topographic relief to kind of separate populations from each other. Um, and so basically, uh, millions and millions of years ago, this salamander family called Pethodontidae evolved there. And this is a family of really small, really cute little salamanders, and it's the most speciose family of salamanders in the world, I believe. And these salamanders are very special because they lack lungs. Yeah, they don't have lungs. They breathe through their skin. And because of this, they are very small, and they need to remain where it is, like, cool and moist. And so, and, it, and the, the, they don't move very much. And so once they're, like, you know, like, situated in their little stream and stuff, they kind of stay there, populations don't intermingle. And so they basically allow populations to evolve into different species. So the United States, because of that main Appalachian region, you're saying that temperate forest in that zone has these nice little, basically nooks and crannies where they can kind of get the best living conditions. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's a really good place for these guys because they don't move very often. They evolved into a very wide array of species. Plethodontids are not only lungless, but also direct developing, meaning that they do not need to go through an aquatic larva phase, instead hatching out of their eggs directly on land. Researchers believe this opened up a world of opportunity for salamanders, and along with their uniquely long tongues, allowed them to catch insects in ways other salamanders couldn't. And the Appalachians were prime territory for their evolution, which contributed to the more than 400 species that we see today. Though this unique advantage is not necessarily shared by other families of salamanders. What about for other species of salamanders like the hellbenders that are as big as two feet? I believe the other family of salamanders is called salamandrids. Can you tell me why there's so many of them as well? Salamandrids, they're also in other parts of the world, so they don't have their epicenter of diversity isn't quite in North America as it is for the, for the plethodontids. And also for hellbenders, they are related to species in Asia as well. So it's not quite like for other kinds of salamanders, the U.S. isn't quite as important as it is for plethodontids, I believe. Given that salamanders have been in North America for millions of years, I could only surmise just how important they must be to our ecosystem, particularly the Appalachian region. So I asked Morgan to explain in more detail what some of the unforeseen consequences 
of the loss of these salamanders could be to our forests? That's a great question. The fact is, there hasn't been a ton of research into the impacts of salamanders on the ecosystems that surround them. Um, However, there have been a few studies that I dug up while I was researching these stories, and they all found that they have some pretty profound impacts on, on their habitat. So basically, they're little predators. They're little predators that live in pretty high density, and they eat a lot of insects and other arthropods. Um, arthropods that eat fungus. They control this fungus, which um, would otherwise take nutrients out of the environment. These salamanders basically help regulate nutrients in forests. They also help control leaf litter. So um, one study I found said that one salamander basically stopped the emissions of 200 kilograms of carbon per hectare every year. And uh, another study found that there were about three redback salamanders per square meter which works out to something like, I think, 2 million per square kilometer. So if you think about that, like that many salamanders with that can control that much carbon emissions into the atmosphere, like that's a pretty huge impact for one, you know, little animal. Yet this biodiversity and variety of salamanders in the Appalachians is a double-edged sword of sorts. Because when a fungal pathogen is introduced into the area, many different species are likely getting exposed quite quickly. So in studies, like, they have the Appalachians and Florida as hotspots for, like, where B-cell would crop up. Because Florida, there's, like, there's a big import area for salamanders from abroad for the pet trade. And also because and the Appalachians have a huge diversity. So basically, there'd be a lot of species that'd be affected if it did get out. So basically, like, why the Appalachians are special in that way is because, like, there's so many species. And they're all relatively close together that for, if someone went hiking there... Um, with the bee cell on their boot, they could spread it to a bunch of different habitats pretty quickly. So that's why that area is red on the on the heat maps for bee cell susceptibility. I've read various reports that, you know, since like the 1970s, various species of certain salamanders have declined, and yet there are still some hardy salamanders out there that seem to be thriving like the eastern newt. What are some of the salamanders in this Appalachian region that you think should be on our radar, or do you, or you think that are most prime candidates for spreading the fungal pathogen? Studies that I've read, they said that all pathodontids are susceptible. Almost all, if not all, salamanders, which are the newts, are susceptible as well. So they're not quite sure yet why some die and some don't. So some might be curious. So for instance, like eastern newts can survive infected for a while, and eastern newts are highly modal, which means they like can walk across land. Eastern newts are different than pathodontids. Like they're little, there's those little kind of charismatic newt things that the spots on them and then and they kind of walk around they can travel fairly large distances and so researchers are really worried about eastern newts specifically as a carrier species for a bee cell because if they can bridge these gaps between habitats that other salamander species like pathodontid species wouldn't be able to do and so yeah they're really worried about eastern newts and they're questing and spreading B-cell. What should someone do if they find a sick or affected salamander, or a salamander that they believe could have a chytrid fungus? What should they do? There are several agencies that are seeking public help in monitoring. There are a bunch of different places who are accepting possibly infected salamanders. It depends kind of where you are. So basically, I would just Google infected salamander, salamander monitoring, and B-cell, B-S-A-L, and see which one closest to you is accepting salamanders, if you find one dead. Additional information on what to do if you find a dead or affected salamander can be found at salamanderfungus.org. Record the date and the location of your find, and contact your state or local wildlife agency. You may also want to consider storing the carcass in a 10% formalin or 70% ethanol liquid. Is there anything about the United States that you wish more people were aware of in terms of amphibian conservation that you could talk about right now that our listeners could take away and use in their day-to-day lives to help improve the, the quality of life for these amphibians? 
Yeah, for day to day, if you're farming, please don't put fertilizer and pesticides down, which I realize it's hard in our commodity agriculture economy. But for people with yards, it would be great if more people didn't have like grass yards that they maintain with herbicide and pesticide, but plant native species, not just so you don't have like have to maintain a lawn, but also because native species of plants have flowers that insects are attracted to. Insects are very important for maintaining populations of amphibians and other things as well. So we are kind of in going through a period of insect decline majorly across the world, it seems. And so one thing you can do for both insects and the things that, that depend on them, like amphibians and honestly, like humans, is to plant more flowers and native plants and not just have a monoculture of grass on your lawn. That's a great segue into my next question. I was going to ask you if you could talk a little bit about the global drops in insect abundance and what kind of drops are we seeing here in the United States and what implications does that have for some of the salamander populations here? As far as I know, there haven't been a lot of studies in the States. There was a study that, that was out in 2020 that was like a, med- a meta study of different studies and found basically that looking at different studies around the world, it finds that there's been a declining abundance rate of insects of 9% per decade since 1990. So it's, and no one knows exactly why. It's this really sinister mystery. From my own personal experience, I don't hear them anymore. You know, there isn't this this hum around me in the summertime in, anymore. It's, it's a huge problem, and one that researchers are wondering is causing the decline. Perhaps a drop in insects is causing the declines of amphibians as well. Morgan's observations about the hum of insects, or lack thereof, is something that I have noticed as well. The once nightly orchestra of insects that filled the evening air of the Appalachian region I live in has now been replaced by a reduced or almost eerily silent night in just five years. But insects aren't the only things that account for the drop in amphibians. We are sitting on a precious network of plant biodiversity of species found nowhere else in the world, the coastal plain, which was home to a once thriving longleaf pine forest, which is now a fraction of what it once was, making the precious habitat of so many salamander species all the more fragile. So coastal plain is a really interesting ecosystem. It stretches from like Massachusetts down to Texas and down the Atlantic coast of Mexico. And I had never heard of it until I started researching these stories, but it is extremely biodiverse. It's like has 1500 endemic plant species, which means plant species that are found nowhere else in the world. And the longleaf pine forest is a huge part of that. And unfortunately, while the longleaf pine forest used to be one of the largest expanses of forest in the U.S., currently less than 5% exists today. So you have a lot of species that can live nowhere else in the entire world now concentrated into these little fragments of longleaf pine that are being preserved. And that includes salamanders as well. So one of these species is called the southern dusky salamander. Researchers are trying to figure out why it's declined like upwards of 90% since the 1970s. And they don't really know. It may be due to habitat loss. It may be due to the introduction of some pathogen by feral pigs. They have no idea. And, and, and they're trying to figure it out. But the fact that very little habitat still exists means that there's very few reservoirs for these species to live in, which is a huge concern for researchers. While that concern is something that the scientific community takes seriously, Morgan fears it isn't necessarily shared by our country at large, and our struggle with our own human pandemic doesn't quell those fears. In your reporting, what was the most significant thing you noticed about our country in particular that's different from the rest of the world that could have the biggest impact on this B-cell pandemic? Oh, that's a great question. When I've been thinking about for the past few months. So when I started reporting this and researching it over a year ago, I was really heartened by how many agencies were involved and how many labs. Like there was action on both the federal and state level to monitor salamander populations for bee cell because it's it's a huge effort. It's I mean there's so many salamanders in so many places and they're hard to find. It takes a lot of resources to do that effectively. But I was like, wow, there's so many people doing this. And there's so many people like, you know, this, the the money, the funding is, is there, which is great. And then COVID hit. And well, I don't know, just, it's hard not to compare a human pandemic to salamander one. And I honestly, I'm kind of worried that the U.S. won't be able or even willing to do much when 
B cell gets here because researchers say that it's when, not if. More than a quarter of COVID-19 deaths have been in the U.S., right? So, like, if the federal government can't effectively tackle a human pandemic, it doesn't exactly inspire confidence for me that it'll be able to deal with a salamander one. Because, like, again, monitoring for B cell costs a lot of money, and when it gets here, it's going to cost more money to to contain it. And so I worry with part of the fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic is going to be government cutting spending. And I worry, given the current administration's track record, that environmental programs and agencies are going to be the first to suffer those cuts. And I worry that B-cell monitoring is going to be a casualty of those cuts. The tragedy of COVID-19 has already reached previously unimaginable levels of devastation. And for many, it may be hard to consider tackling an amphibian pandemic when we are already having so much trouble combating our own. Yet, the potential for loss cannot be overstated. And I asked Morgan to summarize what it is we stand to lose here in the United States when B-cell arrives. Is there any way you can describe to us, paint a picture for the audience, just what's at stake here in terms of the uniqueness of this biodiversity that doesn't occur anywhere else in the world? Can you kind of summarize what we stand to lose? Yeah, I mean, I'm not a herpetologist, um, but from what I learned in, in reporting, we stand to lose basically half the world's salamander species, which is pretty daunting, pretty heavy. And I hope, I wish that, that that was enough to spur action. Unfortunately, I worry that it's not. But yeah, I mean, if, if we lose them, it's not just hundreds and hundreds of species and hundreds of millions of individuals. It's the fact that these animals appear to be critical to forest health as well. So a lot of other species depend on them. And so it's not just half of the world's salamander species. It's forest itself. So um, I would say that's what we have to lose. And yet, as previously mentioned in my conversation with Dr. Karen Lips, B-cell isn't going to be the first amphibian pandemic we will have seen here in the States. To get a sense of how things could potentially play out, Morgan reminds us of BD, or Betrachochytrum dendrobatidis, which is currently here in North America. So since the 1970s, we've seen a lot of frog populations declining. Do you think that any of that is foreshadowing to what we may see with salamanders? What are some of the things that you think that happened with that decline, do you think could happen with the salamander one? The biggest pressure behind amphibian declines in the world is habitat loss. But there's also this fungal threat called BD, which is related to B-cell, that affects frogs primarily, that has driven 200 species towards extinction and, I think, actually caused the outright extinctions of at least four species that are known. We have this precedent. We know what might happen, what probably will happen, and the fact that it's good to be armed with this knowledge and and, and researchers are using this to try to figure out an an appropriate response for when B-cell gets to North North America. It's it's almost like, you know, we can try our best to save salamanders, but the most important thing is preventing it from getting here because we kind of know what will happen once it gets here. It'll be really hard to isolate it in the environment. So given BD's track record and the fact that we know what B-cell does to salamanders who didn't evolve with it, basically like the European salamanders where it wiped out like 90-something percent of populations in the the Netherlands, we kind of know what's going to happen. And so the important part is like monitoring for B-cell, trying to clamp down on the trade of salamanders and frogs as frogs can actually carry B-cell because they think that it's probably going to get into the into the U.S. via trade routes, um, most likely, because we know it's going to happen. We've, we've seen frog populations and species blink out because of BD, so we have that precedent. That precedent is precisely the playbook through which wildlife agencies are taking valuable lessons from, and it's the subject of my next conversation with Daniel Greer of the United States Geological Survey and energy reporter Benji Jones in our next episode. During that conversation, we will dive into the Herculean effort of tracking down this fungus in the wild and the many years of intensive study and resources behind the search. Thank you all once again for joining me. I also want to extend my thanks to Morgan Erickson Davis for joining me today and for her past and continued work on this incredible developing story.
To hear about how the U.S. scientific community discovered B-cell, what they know about the disease thus far, and the important steps they are taking to be ready for its arrival, please listen to Episode 1 of Manga Bay Explorers, where I speak with Dr. Karen Lips. I'd like to extend a hearty thanks to our podcast producer, Eric Hoffner, and also to Rhett Butler. Watch for a new edition of Manga Bay Explorers every two weeks, in between episodes of our flagship podcast, The Manga Bay Newscast. Special projects like this are made possible by our Patreon supporters. Manga Bay is a nonprofit news provider, so we rely on the generosity of our listeners, readers, and friends. To add your support, head to patreon.com forward slash manga bay to learn more. Keep up with all of Manga Bay's news from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com or get updates via Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, where our handle is at manga bay. Thank you once again, and we'll be back soon with another episode of Manga Bay Explorers.